Okay, today, guys, I'm excited to talk to you about how you can use your primary residence to invest. This means invest in, let's say, a multifamily dwelling, rental properties, apartment complexes, storage facilities, anything. You can use that to invest by using the house that you already reside in. So we're going to talk about how you can use that money and use that money wisely. Let's talk about it. But before I get into what you came here for today, I want to make sure you hit that subscribe button, click that notification bell so that you're the first to see content when we post every Sunday. We try to post relevant information to you guys about personal finance, law school, the law, just personal life and how to survive every Sunday. So make sure you click that subscribe button so that you can keep up with what we're doing every week. Okay, so if you live in the United States, the American dream is to buy your own house with the white picket fence. Well, maybe not the white picket fence anymore, but buy your own house and own property. And so that's kind of a symbol of, okay, I have achieved the American dream. But I want to let you know it doesn't stop there because once you achieve the American dream, your bills don't stop. And so what I want to talk to you today is about how you can use your primary residence to actually invest in vehicles that can actually make you money, that can cash flow every month. The average person who owns a single family home, that home is not making them any money. If you perhaps own a multifamily home, you might be renting out the other floors to residents and tenants and you perhaps are making money that way. But if you have a single family home, it's probably just a big liability for you every month. It's not actually making you any money per se. But what I'm going to talk to you about how to use a cash out refinance to use money from the equity in your home to invest in actually a money cash flow property. And I know it depends on the area, what opportunities are available to you, but I'm going to personally talk about what's op available in the Houston area. And it may also be things that you can look into for your particular area as well. So let's get into details about what a cash out refi is, refinance. And what are the benefits of owning real estate for tax purposes and for other purposes as well? Okay, let's start with the basics first before I talk about the actual cash out refi. So the basics are you buy a home, let's say you buy a home for $100,000 and it appreciates in value and it's appraised, assessed at $150,000. Let's say that just for simplicity's sake. In that particular situation, it appreciated from 100,000 that you brought it at to 150,000. So essentially you have $50,000 worth of equity in that house that potentially you can use for, for different purposes. There's a lot of other factors, but just for the purposes of this uh, conversation, we're gonna say that's the case, $50,000 worth of equity. What I'm trying to explain to you today is that you can use that $50,000 of equity to actually invest in a property it can use, be used as a down payment for another property that pays for itself. So the idea of not having to come up necessarily with that amount of money to do an investment is very appealing to people. Um, usually when you buy your primary residence, you may be able to find a deal if, you, if you're not doing conventional, which requires 20% down. Some offers may allow you to put 3.5% down or less than 20% down. When you're doing a, an investment property, it's more than likely that you're going to have to put down 20% because it's not your primary residence. There are different type of programs that may allow you to do less than 20%, but the typical for investment properties, that down payment is 20%. And so it might be hard to come up with that kind of money, especially for a multifamily house. That's going to be a little bit more money than, let's say, a single family house because it, the, excuse me, the owner and the bank knows that it's a money-making venture. And so it's going to be a little bit more expensive. So you're probably wondering like, well, how will I even start this adventure of buying a property when I can't even come up with a 20% down payment for this investment property? And that's where cash out refinances come in handy. So let's break down how you can get a cash out refi. What are the requirements? Um, when is it a good idea? When is it not a good idea? And some things you can you should consider before going down that path. Okay, so a cash out refinance is basically where you're refinancing your home. And so you're doing the whole terms of the loan again, 
And this time you're saying, basically, I want to take the profits, the equity in my home and have access to them now to do what I want with it. So it's different from a home equity loan where basically it's used for uh, improvements on your actual primary residence. This almost creates a line of credit for you, but is actually rolled into a loan for your house. And so I'll break down a little bit how it works and what's required. So unlike a regular refinance, which I think the credit score for a regular refinance, basically when you're saying, I just want a lower interest rate, can we can we do the loan over with a lower interest rate and don't take any money out? I think the minimum credit score is 580. So that's just like saying, I just I want to take advantage of the better interest rates. With a cash out refi, there's a higher, um, I guess, entry point for credit score if you want to do a cash out refinance. And that's, I believe, 620. So you say you want to refinance the loan. That means change of the interest rate. And you want to access some of the equity, essentially the profit you made off of it. And there are two ways that you can have equity in your home. One obvious way is as you pay your monthly mortgage payment every month, you pay into the mortgage, the mortgage goes down, and so you you create equity. Another one is that the just the prices in the house in the area in your house appraises for a higher amount than what you previously paid for it. And the difference between what you owe and what the house is worth is your equity. So let's say you bought the house at a hundred thousand dollars and then they built a whole bunch of like uh, shopping center and things of that nature. And now your house appreciated, the house in that area now selling for $300,000. That, that'd be great. Everybody would want to buy that. Let's say $200,000. So let's say the equity in the home right now is $100,000, right? You owe 100 is appraised at 200. The difference between 100 and 200 is 100,000. You have $100,000 worth of equity available. But with a cash out refi, the bank is not going to let you take all your equity out in order to do a cash out refi. They're like, ah, ah, ah. remember, essentially, there's always got to be an 80-20 ratio. So they also they always want you to have at least 20 percent of equity in your in your home available to you. So they're not going to let you take all of that. They'll let you take a percentage of that. So you can take 80,000 out. You have to leave 20 of that in the loan. In my example, I just gave as far as the equity that you have available. So you, in that example, you would have $80,000 that you can cash out and use as a down payment to an investment property. And so the worry about well, how I'm going to come up with a, a 20% down payment on this investment property that could be a very good deal. Ding, ding, ding. If you already own a house and you have equity in it, you can access it. And like I said, as long as you don't go over that 80-20 ratio, you can use that money um, to do whatever you want with it. Some people use it to pay off higher loans. But in this example, I'm going to say to use it to invest because we're talking about investing and making money, making ventures. Okay, so let me stop for a minute and talk about the the pros and cons of doing a cash out refi. So in my previous example, I said that you had $100,000 left, let's say $100,000 left on your loan and you pulled out $80,000 worth of equity to invest in this investment property. That $80,000 the actual cost of it is rolled into the current loan. So you start out with a hundred thousand dollar loan, the eighty thousand dollars is rolled into it, so now it becomes a hundred and eighty thousand dollar loan that you have to pay for. So keep that in mind that you can afford the higher payments, right? Because now your mortgage payments are going to be increased because your loan has increased. The benefit though is that you're getting access to it at a pretty decent, a lower interest rate, and that you can use the money to make money over here and We'll talk about the tax benefits about the investment property that you invested in, but just be sure that you can actually manage the higher payments when you do a cash out refi because you are actually going to have an increased loan after you pull out the equity. You're basically, like I said, borrowing from the profit that you could make. Let's say if you just sold the house, you would have had a profit and could do what you want with it, but you wouldn't have a primary residence anymore. This allows you to still stay in your house, access the equity slash profit and invest it into a property. So one of the cons would be you will have an increased mortgage payment, but one of the pros would be you also own an investment property and can benefit from that paying for itself and have tax write-offs from that. So there's pros and cons with everything, but I do want to make sure I'm very transparent with you about how that works. Okay, one more con about it is that when you're refinancing, you have to make sure that your debt-to-income ratio is 50% or less. 
And so the banks or the lenders are going to be looking at when you roll over that $80,000 into your current loan and your payments increase, will that put you at a debt to income ratio higher than 50%? And if it does, they won't let you refinance. So you got to make sure all your little ducks are in a row with every all your other finances and that you're still below that threshold so that you qualify for the refi. Okay, so I'm going to pause real quick to talk about another way that you can invest. And this is going to be an upcoming video. Comment below if you're interested in finding out how you can use uh, whole life insurance by overfunding whole life insurance to invest in properties. This video is talking about how to use your primary residence, but there are many ways that you can invest in investment properties and using whole life insurance is a, a way that I basically stamp of approval. So comment below. There are other ways that you can actually invest in rental properties or investment properties. But I want to know what you guys think about that if you're interested in that kind of topic as well. Okay, so let's get back to the pros of doing a, a refi because obviously I feel like the pros outweigh the cons. I wanted to make sure that I was upfront with you that there are some things that you should consider before taking this route. But let's go back to the pros. So you're accessing basically the equity in your home to invest in other things. And let's say you say, well, $80,000 might be not enough for what I need to do. How can I still invest in these properties? And that's where I would say do a joint venture. Tracy and I have similar ideas and we basically can pool our money together to buy bigger properties. Obviously, you're going to have to split the profits because it's not just your money going into the deal, but you can actually achieve more because you have somebody um, working together with you. So it's called a JV, a joint venture. And you will write up a contract and, and somebody else can be doing the same thing. They own their own home and they have ac access to their equity. They can do a cash out refi. You can do one. And you can have, let's say, between the two of you guys, have $160,000 that you can invest in a property. If you were in Houston, that can be more than enough to invest in, let's say, a 10-unit apartment building. And that's 10 different tenants paying you money every month. And you want to make sure you get a good deal so that basically the apartment building pays for itself and still has money left over as far as a profit every month for you guys to split. And so you wouldn't mind splitting it if you were like, okay, basically we have 10 times the amount that I wouldn't be able to do if I had to do it by myself. I wouldn't mind splitting it with someone else. So get with your friends, make sure that you are having an attorney review the agreement so there's no problems about money. Because when people talk about money, they get funny. You want to make sure you guys are protected on both sides. But a joint venture is a, def a definite good way of uh, accessing more investment properties than you could do by yourself. So check into doing that as far as you and multiple friends cash out refi and using it for investment properties. Okay, so the benefits of owning real estate is not just the cash flow or the profits you make off the investments. It's actually the tax benefits. It helps you lower your tax bracket so that you have to pay Uncle Sam less money. So comment below if you know about the tax benefits of owning real estate. I know there was a big deal when um, Trump, they, they showed Trump's finances and they said he was trying to write off everything. Trump is actually a real estate investor. He knows about the tax code and the benefits of owning real estate. You need to be like him in that respect just that respect. But you need to be like him in regards to taking advantage of the, how the tax code was written, written and it basically gives ta uh, real estate investors a hundred different things to write off. And you want to be able to write that off so that you not only don't owe any taxes or they owe you some money. And so some of the benefits of owning real estate is that you can write off depreciation. So uh, improvements on the land can be written off as depreciation and you can write that off. Um, you can write off of course, you can write out property taxes and mortgage interest. And then there's something called cost segregation where you can basically, it's kind of like a bonus depreciation where you can accelerate the time that things depreciate and write that off as well. And so we won't go into detail about cost segregation, but if you check in the description box, I'll leave some links to people who do a great job at explaining the cost segregation study if you have investment properties. But think of it as bonus depreciation. You already know the benefits of depreciating a property. Basically, the government gives you credit for saying like this property, it goes down in value as it gets older and it allows you to write down the value that is depreciated um, off your taxes, off of your taxable income. 
And so when you start getting into real estate, you can write off a whole bunch of things that you wouldn't be able to write off if you just had your regular W-2 job. Another benefit of that is, you know, a side benefit is like owning a business. When you own an LLC or a business, you can write off certain things. People, this is how people are keeping their money. You work a W-2 job, you get into a certain bracket. The government takes away a lot of your money in taxes. You, how do you protect that? You start finding how you can keep more of your money by writing things off through real estate uh, investments and owning businesses of that nature. So it's not just about when you're thinking about investment properties, don't think small in regards to I, I'm only going to make $200 a month off it or something at first. You make $200 a month plus all these whole list of things just by you owning it as an investment property. So think of that. It's $200 plus all these other things. So in, in the long run, it actually benefits you, helps you keep more of your hard earned money. I don't know if you guys have read a book called Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Basically, he talks about how there's different ways of viewing being rich and being wealthy and how he discovered that all debt isn't bad. And so I kind of I think we're kind of conditioned to think like, oh, I don't want to get into debt and have these mortgages out there. Certain debt is good debt. If the actually acquiring this bigger loan, this bigger mortgage uh, allows you to make more money off this investment property, it's pennies compared to what you're actually making. And so it's okay to have certain kinds of debt. I wouldn't say run up debt for a credit card, for TV or pocketbooks, things you that don't make any money. But if it's going into debt for something that's going to make you money, way more money than it'll cost the, the minor interest rate or the fees associated with it. If it balances out that basically the investment property is going to make way more money, it's okay to be in debt for those reasons. And, and, and be okay with knowing that because I know you've been conditioned a long time to think that debt is bad, but it's not. Not all debt is bad. As you grow in your real estate career or journey, you'll get to a point where you you'll hear them say, use other people's money to buy these investment properties. And what they mean is that let's say you are get, got good at finding these investment properties and then you just don't have money. Like, oh, if I only had the money to buy it. Let's say you've tapped out all your credit availability right now, all your cash availability, and you're like, okay, I have to sit still for a while. If you know of a good property and you know people who have the money, you can be that middleman and basically manage the property for them or manage that deal and make a percentage off of it. But we won't go into that too fast. I want you guys to uh, start somewhere, start with, let's say, the cash out refi and follow that journey somewhere else. But I want to let you know that there are many options out there, including using other people's money for you to make money on investment deals as well. Hopefully you and you will follow Tracy and our journey as we try to do the real estate, the attorney thing in our regular lives. But I'm glad that you tuned in today to figure out how you can actually make a money move for yourself by using your current primary residence.